Hi there, welcome to Boxing Deep Dive. I'm Lyndon Hosking, and as always, great to have you along for an episode of Dream Fights. This is where we get two fighters from different eras, match them up against each other, break it all down, and uh, reveal who we think wins and why. It's probably our most controversial um, episode that we do, or series that we do, uh, but we have a lot of fun with it, and uh, it's great to have a lot of interaction with you guys out there with your feedback, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, but uh, always lots of fun anyway. I'm going to bring in my co-host for this week's episode. I'm referring to Mike Altamura. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm great. Again, no, no, no Tazzy Brown. I tried to pick. I know, I know that Tazzy struggles on this program <laughs> whenever we're covering the careers of his colleagues or his friends within the industry. Mm. So I try to avoid those kind of clashes. Yet still no Tazzy Brown, but that's okay. I'm excited for what we have on offer, and I think that one particular fighter we're covering, the modern-day fans, certainly have a deep knowledge of his career yeah. and skill set and the excitement he brings to sport, but I think we've got an opportunity to educate him once again today. Yeah, no, 100%, mate. I really love this. Uh, actually, before we get going, let's have a look at the, the um, fight we're actually talking about. Who you got? So we have schoolboy Bobby Chacon against Ryan Garcia. I love Old this fight. Duke. Uh, yeah, no, I love this fight, Mike, because um, we've got the modern-day matinee idol in Ryan Garcia and the schoolboy Bobby Shakon. Now, I love this um, this matchup because you've got the modern-day superstar, I suppose you call him, totally unproven, by the way. Uh, we're all sort of been a little bit speculative um, of what he can he can achieve, but Bobby Shakon. Um, I love him being brought up because if a lot of our uh, watchers or that out there probably aren't too familiar with Bobby Shakon. And, um, and I think it's great that you bring him up and, and give him a little bit of uh, the limelight on, on the show. Yeah, and of course, Bobby, the nickname Schoolboy is because he turned professional while still in California State High School. So, <laughs> you know, he was, I know Ryan Garcia is the one that the girls have gone ballistic for on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and all the social media platforms. But, you know, Bobby Chacon was the real deal. He was the equivalent in that era. There was fan clubs, there was badges being sold outside venues, headbands, T-shirts, everything. So he had probably an even grander fandom than Ryan Garcia, but it's hard to kind of see that comparison just because it's such a different world. You know, the world he grew up in, which was the early 70s, as a star prospect is very different to 2020, as you know. But both of them just pinups, both of them... Uh, pin up to the California boxing scene. Hundred percent, this fight would sell out any venue, whether Staples Center, Olympic Auditorium, or Olympic Auditorium, whatever venue it may be in California. This would have been one that had the fans' mouths watering. Yeah, they, they certainly bred them differently back then, didn't they? And uh, they fought regularly and fought the best. And a loss was just like just a temporary setback, and they'd just go again. And totally different these days, and probably. These two fighters together are probably the yin and yang of the boxing spectrum, I suppose, because you've got Ryan Garcia, who hasn't been overly active, but then you had Bobby Chacon, who was fighting all the time. So opposite ends of, of everything. I'll, I'll take the 70s and 80s any time, Mike, but um, for the uh, you know, for the sake of the show, I mean, I love the matchup. And look, considering that Bobby Chacon, um, obviously a very, very proven um, multiple world champion and, and great Hall of Famer, and Garcia, even though he's pretty much unproven at the mo at, at the moment, I think it would have been a great matchup. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's an interesting contrast to style, so we'll get mm. into that breakdown yep. as we analyse each individual fighter. But I think that all we need to know is that both guys have very high knockout ratios, mm. and both are great finishers once they get their opponents in trouble. So you can you can expect that there's going to be some fireworks. For sure, mate. All right. Well, before we get into this. Uh, breakdown. We'll go to last week's episode, or last week's matchup. It was uh, Tassie, I think, yeah, Tassie picked that one. It was Thomas Hearns and Julian Jackson, the battle of probably the two biggest super welterweight punches of all time. And this was the result. It was Thomas Hearns, 58% over Julian Jackson. It was actually quite close there for a while, I will say. Um, no surprise to that all the um, people that actually went for both of them, both pretty much picked them by knockout. I think there might have been one or two that actually chose, chose one of them by decision. So, um, but yeah, it would have been that would have been a great fight. 
if anyone selected decision, it's because they must have got it confused and hit that button and thought that that's <laughs> if the referee decides to stop the fight. Mm. Yeah, we had about 100 or so people that voted and there's only one or two that went for a decision. I think it might have both been Hearns by decision. Actually, it might have been one that picked Julian Jackson by decision. That's probably the last result I would ever pick, Julian Jackson by decision. I think his only hope, really, is to knock Thomas Hearns out, which is obviously a distinct possibility, but... Uh, um, skill set to skill set, you would think Tommy Hearns would have him covered every day of the week. Like I said, maybe they thought that if the referee waves a fight off, that's a decision, so the referee decides to stop well, it. It is a, that's a, a decision. decision. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only rationale for picking Julian Jackson on points. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's get into this one. Let's get firstly on to, uh, we'll start with Ryan Garcia. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong one. There he is. His record, 23-0, 19 KOs at the moment. No world titles to speak of. It was pretty hard digging up a lot of his achievements and uh, titles. You can see the NABF Super Featherweight Champion in 2017. The WBC Interim Lightweight Champion in 2021. He won that against Luke Campbell. You can see there he stopped in seven rounds. Was put on his backside by Luke Campbell. And there's just a few of his wins there. Most recently over, excuse me, Javier Fortuna uh, with a six-round knockout. Mike, what, what makes you um, bring Ryan Garcia up as being suitable for a dream fight, especially against the likes of a Bobby Chacon? I think because of the fact that he moves the needle in an era where so few fighters do, especially fighters that have never won a recognised world championship, yet every time Garcia fights, and, and by the way, there's discussion now that it's very close to wrapping up a contest with him and Javonta Davis, which Oof. that's yeah. going to be the defining fight of his career, and yep. maybe... Maybe post that result, we'll revisit our thoughts on today. But I think it's just the fact that he moves the needle. He's producing sellout crowds at the StubHub Centre for fights of this ilk with Vargas. I mean, that's really, that's just a regular opponent, Fernando Vargas, there. And, you know, that's drawing a sellout crowd. That's the kind of attraction that he is. He definitely, as I said, moves the needle, fits into this era of fighters. And he's very fun and exciting to watch. And, I know that there's some habits he has. stands stands a little high. He's a little bit hittable, but Chin up in the you air. can't dis mm. yeah you can't discount the fact that he's a hellacious puncher. I mean, he knocked mm. out Luke Campbell, who's an Olympic gold medalist. So yep. there is some solid wins on his record. Even getting the likes of Fortuna out of there, uh, forcing Emmanuel Tago, who was top five in the world, into a defensive shell for 12 rounds. To me, that that suggests that he's a very very heavy-handed puncher. Mm. Yeah, he is, and, and I think the thing obviously about him, regardless whether he can fight or not, it's just the, um, or not, it's the whole package, and he's a very, very good-looking guy, um, he's got um, the looks, the social media aspect, a um, little bit of Hollywood about him in the ring, and it obviously reminds you of his ex-promoter, or is he still his current promoter, Oscar De La Hoya, is he still with Oscar? I'm not sure he is. He's still with Oscar. Yeah, he's still... That was the trainer he got rid of, wasn't it? Yeah, Eddie Reynoso. Yeah, yeah Eddie Reynoso. So while he was with Reynoso, there was a little a little bit of back and forth with De La Hoya and a bit of fallout, but I think now he's on fairly positive terms with Golden Boy, which is yeah. good to see. You don't want anyone's career held up by litigation sitting mm. on the sidelines, especially in their prime. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think if anyone can probably guide Ryan Garcia through the, the pitfalls of being the matinee, matinee idol of his generation, and not that this guy's done anything like what Oscar's um, done, but you know that's up to him now. But if anyone can guide him through the minefield of being a superstar, it's obviously Oscar De La Hoya, because he probably learnt the hard way in a few different ways as well. So hopefully he can be a little bit more positive influence on Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's what's been spoken about at large, is that... De La Hoya, on his good days anyways, can be a really solid mentor for the kid and, and guide him through it. One thing you see with, with Ryan, for anyone that wants to talk about his technical flaws, he's a, he's a devastating puncher, especially with that left hook. I mean, he's got, he's got great finishing instincts as well. Here he is against Luke Campbell. And you see, and you see I mean, that's, a, that's an Olympic, uh, as I said, that's an Olympic gold medalist. Mm. And he, Who he's dropped him a couple of rounds earlier. Yeah, that, that's correct. But you still see the ferocity here to finish him, mm. to, to keep that pressure and to eventually drown Campbell. And I know that, you know, Lomachenko is not the biggest puncher, but Campbell was able to survive 12 rounds with him. So, mm. you know, th this was quite a statement performance, I felt. Mm. Do you, Where do you see Ryan Garcia? I mean, it's probably a little bit off point to 
the matchup itself. But where do you see him in the um, context of today's lightweights with so many of the, uh, the good ones around at the moment, or marketable ones around? Uh, look, I think you, you have to, just on just on accomplishment, you've got to rank Deb and Haney at the top of the tree together mm-hmm. with Tank Davis. I think those two, in, in different ways, have proven their worth. And then, of course, you've got Lomachenko there who had the injury against Teofimo Lopez. And, I mean, there's other guys coming through. Frank Martin, yeah, Cambosis, who's just lost back-to-back to Haney, but he doesn't fall too, too far. But I think that Ryan realistically is just that notch below Haney, below Tank, probably just below Lomer on accomplishment because he's untested, but he's a tier above, say, Cambosis, a tier above Frank Martin, those kind of guys. A lot of what we're working on is potential and yeah, yeah, I was just say that. Mm. But it's it's a way that he's wrecked solid contenders. Like Romero Duno when he fought him was on a really strong winning streak and he crushed him in a round. A lot mm. of people thought that that was a fight fraught with danger. You know, Fortuna, tricky left hander, very capable, very adept at surviving, and Ryan didn't give him a chance to survive. And I think that. Because he has those kind of finishing instincts, that's why we want to see him against the best. Because, as I said, for the technical flaws, you know, one, one big right, one one big left hook or one big right hand mm. could completely change the scope against the other elite fighters. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, he's going to have his hands full with this bloke, and I'm referring to Bobby Chacon, the schoolboy. You can see there, 59, 7, and 1, 47 big KOs. Two-time world champion, the WBC featherweight title in 74 and the WBC super featherweight title in 82. See some of his biggest fights there. He fought a few guys multiple times. Ruben Oliveira is there. You see Danny Lopez, one of the greats as well. You go right down there, the Rafael, Rafael Bazooka, Limon, Alexis Aguayo, of course. Cornelius Bozza Edwards, the great uh, Bozza Edwards. Uh, fought him a couple of times. And, of course, Ray Mancini as well. So... Mike, like he's, all those fights there, he simply just fought the best of his era and more than held his own. He won some, he lost some, but the fact he was a two-time world champion in that era shows us how great he was. What I respect about Chacon is he found a way to avenge five of his seven losses, mm. which that's, that's just an incredible statistic. It is, that's amazing, own. I didn't know that. And he was, he was a guy that was prepared to walk through the front door. He, he knew the danger, he knew the fire he needed to walk through, but... He always backed his strength and toughness. Whether he was only five foot five, but more more a volume puncher, heavy handed, but more a guy that you'd walk into a tornado. So if he if he had you hurt, it was a 20, 30 punch combination that was about to come come your way that would drown you. It wasn't he wasn't finishing many guys off with just one shot. It was usually an accumulation. But just just a great all action fighter, really fun to watch. Had a had an ability to come back from adversity, both from knockout losses, but also in fights, be hurt in fights, be down in fights, and find ways to turn them late on, on you know, desire and hard work and determination. And he's he's a guy here. You see him banging up uh, Danny Little Red Lopez, yeah, who becomes another great world champion. Mm. You know, another another great of the seventies. Like if you really look at his record, it's just stacked with top tier contenders and Hall of Fame talent. Yeah, it is. And I actually like him, liken him to a, uh, a Churro Gaddy. I know that the styles are probably a little bit different, but just that that same, I don't care who you are and what you've done or who you've beat, I'm here to fight, so let's go. And could also could be on the verge of being stopped and, and come back. And, you know, maybe, well, probably unlike Gaddy, who was probably just that fraction below those really top-tier guys, you know, the Mayweathers and De La Hoyas and those types of guys, of course. Shaquan maybe was a little bit different, but I, that stat you, you said before was an amazing one where he avenged five of his seven losses. That's amazing. And this, and, and was it the... Who, who did he fight four times? Was it Limon? Bazooka Limon? Yeah, Bazooka Limon and Cornelius Bose Edwards, of course. He had that devastating loss yep. for the world title, stopped in 13 rounds and then come mm. back to avenge it in his first world title defense late in his career so again i mean that takes a lot of metal to come back and and overcome those hurdles the other thing with bobby like stylistically and you know this yourself Lyndon. you know i mean you, you're a hell of a fighter i mean hardest way to hurt someone is when you're backing up mm. and he was always dangerous you see guys chasing him when they when they perceive they had him hurt or whatever see they're placed on the ropes bang just firing grenades and didn't need much room to really get his punches flowing 
Mm. I, I remember sort of Bobby Chacon more when I first sort of started to follow the sport in the early age, 82, 83, when I really started to take an interest. And it was about the time, I think he fought Ray Mancini. That was probably the first time, I think I'd sort of read a little bit about the Edwards fight, which might have happened just before that. But the Ray Mancini fight was the big one where it was, you know, billed as a super fight. But in reality, Chacon was probably a little bit shot by them, wasn't he? Obviously, and he got stopped in three rounds. Yeah, look, and it was probably just the weight was a little bit too much for him. Yeah. He was really 130 pounder, featherweight 130 pounder, and yeah, the, the wars had finally worn him out. I mean, his his uh, title recapturing effort with Bazooka Limon, and then this bout he had the defense against Cornelius Boza Edwards were back to back fight of the years, mm. and you know those um, those 30 rounds of activity, both 15 rounds probably aged him about, you know, five to ten years in fight years, just those two particular bouts. And he, he still went on to have about another 15 bouts from there. He got stripped, of course, and mm. stepped up in weight, tested himself against the best in the world in Ray Mancini and come up was short. Was that top of his game at the time too, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, mm. that was and, – and, and Ray said it. You know, I've, I've spoken to Ray uh, at length regarding that oh, fight. Okay. And, he said that, and he said that, you know – it hurt him and it broke his heart to have to fight that version of Bobby because he idolized and he loved Bobby and Bobby was such a gentleman and so respectful always to him when he was on the way up. But he's like, it, it was the only way that really business was gonna ascend to the next level. You need to fight the guys that are superstars from that era just prior to yours. I guess, mm. similarly in Australia, we talk about Costa Zou facing Julio Cesar Chavez. We know it's not one of his best wins, mm. but it's what helped build his brand and his stardom. And that was the same with Ray. And again, you know, it's a shame sometimes that people only remember a fighter from what's accessible. And because that fight's been seen a lot on knockout tapes and on ESPN Classic and things of that nature, a lot of people out there, that might be their only impression of Bobby Chacon, but he was mm. so much more than that. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, and you mentioned Costa Zoo with uh, Chavez. Well, obviously it happened to him as well with Hatton as well. So, you know, it's, it's amazing how it happens. But um, mate, well, this is the obviously the most important time then. Ryan Garcia, Bobby Chacon, who wins and why? I just look at, I look at stability. And I know that there's going to be somebody out there listening who's going to think I'm a madman because I'm telling you there's more stability in the guy that suffered five stoppage defeats in his career. But I just think that Bobby Chacon was more proven, had a greater capability to overcome adversity. And the one box that Ryan Garcia is yet to check, because Chacon's not going to fold in two or three rounds. If he gets knocked down early, whatever it may be in the fight, which is highly possible with the punching power Garcia possesses, I think that Chacon is going to find the way to motor back. And what we don't know about Ryan Garcia is how he deals with the volume of a ferocious, fresh fighter on his chest looking to mow him down. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could argue that even though I'll say that Luke Campbell was a great win, he's catching Luke at the end of his reign. Yeah. Luke retired after that bout. You look at Javier Fortuna, he didn't fight a prime Javier Fortuna. He fought a Fortuna that had been through a lot of wars and a lot of tough battles and yo-yoed weight. And, and then so you really look at that and there's not a lot of, not a whole heap of depth in the record really whereas you look at Chacon and he's fought Ruben Olivares who's arguably the greatest punch in bantamweight of all time mm. and you know fought him and got stopped by him and was able twice stopped by him and was able to come back and defeat him in the rematch fought the likes of Chuchu Castillo fought Danny Little Red Lopez again one of these names might not mean anything to anyone but one of the most heaviest handed fighters of the 70s Fought the likes of Ray Mancini. Aguayo. Walked through fire. Yeah, Aguayo. And, and that was only stopped by a cut. And he was leaving in that fight. So I just look at, I think he's a proven entity. And I just don't know how Ryan's going to handle that pressure when it gets to those later rounds. I just think that, you know, Ryan could even outbox him for a stretch in the fight. But eventually, Bobby's going to get to him. Round, maybe around round 11 to round 12, 13, thereabouts. I just think, I just think that the pressure at Chacon's going to drown him. Yeah, no, I have to agree, mate. I, look, I think for me, it's a matter of um, what you know versus what you don't know. Garcia's yeah. 
could be this and he could be that, but he, he might not. Now, he's looked pretty good against the opposition so far. I think um, my view, and I'm sure yours, will change as well if he beats a Tank Davis or one of those, uh, you know, uh, Lomachenko, Haney, whatever it might be. I think our view might change, but at the moment, the facts are he hasn't beaten any of those types of guys yet, even though I think he could. Um, select on, on who you're going to fight, of course, but... I think he could be, again, could be a De La Hoya type down the track who has these great fights and goes down as one of the greats. But for me, there's just too much what-ifs where with Chacon, you know exactly what you're getting. You're sending him against all those greats. Yes, he won a few, lost a few, but you always knew what you were going to get. Uh, and one thing that, I've, that I know that we would get from him against Garcia is he's just standing in front of Garcia and he would be taking the fight on. And yes, he might get dropped, he, he might get hurt, but... I think he's the type of guy that would just keep coming and coming and coming and wearing down someone like Garcia, who hasn't really had to dig deep just yet. Now, he, who knows, down the track he might have that inside, but at the moment we haven't seen it. So I'm going to go for Bobby Chacon to gradually wear him down. Maybe the first two, three, four rounds might be a little bit hairy for him, but I think once the groove of the fight sets in, um, I just think that Chacon mows him down and gets him out of there in 10, 11 rounds, I think. So... Might not knock him out, but I think he might get stopped or maybe, you know, the referee might stop or his corner might stop it, whatever. But uh, either way, it would be uh, an awesome fight. And, and again, mate, I, I really like the fight because I'm sure there's people out there that don't know a hell of a lot about Bobby Chacon at all. So re do your research. Check him out on YouTube. There's lots of great fights of him on there. Um, do yourself a favour, as they say, and, and uh, have a look because uh, you won't be disappointed. One of the all-time greats and, and obviously a um, International Boxing Hall of Fame um, inductee in 2005, I think it was. So, Yeah, and I mean, if you, if you know more details of Bobby's story, then it cuts even deeper. So mm. um, his wife, uh, before he fought Ubalde, so his wife, he'd, he'd been stopped by Cornelius Bose Edwards in the 13th round. And his wife, uh, Valeria, who actually was the one who encouraged him to turn pro, they were, they were teen lovers, and she rode all the storms with him and begged him to retire. And Bobby still held on to the dream of wanting to become world champion. And the night that he fought Ibalde, his wife took a gun and, and killed herself. She didn't oh, want I didn't to know that. Yeah, that. And then she didn't want was... to deal with the wow. Yeah, she didn't that's... want to deal with the pain of, wow. of of losing her husband to the sport. And it's it's uplifting and sad at the same time when you think of this. Mm. So, Bobby. His wife passed that day, killed herself that day. Bobby went and fought, won the fight, uh, put together a few more wins, secures the opportunity to fight Bazooka Lamont, knocks Bazooka Lamont down with 20 seconds left mm. in the 15th round, and eke out a decision. Mm. Goes, avenges the loss to Cornelius Bozer Edwards. And you would think by the close of that that it's kind of a bittersweet existence. Mm. But mm. Un unfortunately... You know, Bobby held on too long. He had that loss to Mancini. Went on to beat, on a very controversial decision, the likes of Freddie Roach. And won his last, say, 10, 12 fights, whatever it may be. I'd have to look at the record. But it had a sustained damage and on him. When, when I met him, which would have been in 2008 or 2009, I could in a gym in California, I could hardly understand a word he was saying. And, and that was heartbreaking to me. Yeah, and I bet it was. And he obviously passed. What? When did he pass? It was. It was only in recent years he passed. Yeah. I'd have to look it up. It was around maybe 2014, 20, 2015. Yeah, I knew it wasn't could've, that could've, long ago. Been, but, yeah, it could have even been later. I'll bring, I'll bring it up so we're factually yeah. accurate. 2016. 2016. Yeah, 20, 2016. But it's sad. It's sad. It's bittersweet, but sad that the fact that his wife begged him to retire because she was so concerned about his long-term health. And then it's led to that tragedy. He's gone on, fulfilled what he felt his legacy was. But boxing's still taken so much of a part of him. And that's why when we have programs like this and we have an opportunity to remember and, and pay respect to legends like Bobby Chacon, we should. Mm. No, 100%, mate. No, it was, it was a great choice, as I said. So, um, so that was uh, Ryan Garcia, Bobby Chacon. We both went for a late round stoppage for Chacon. Uh, interesting to hear your thoughts uh, out there. It'll be on the, uh, the obviously the Instagram uh, poll as well. So that's back to me for next week. Now, Mike, I've got a, I've got a fight next week. It's it's an all Aussie affair, and I've got to warn you ahead of time. 
that it's probably going to divide a few people, maybe test a few relationships, all that sort of stuff. It's one I, that I can't mind. believe. Huh? I don't mind that. It's Tazzy, it's Tazzy who tries to play politician. I don't mind. Well, I'll get in trouble. I don't, I don't care. It's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. Well, we'll see how you go when I, when I say the fight, but it's definitely be, going to be one that's going to test the waters. Now, as I said, it's an all Aussie fight, super fight. I'm referring to the IBF super featherweight world champions, Lester Ellis, Robbie Peden. We're going to put them against each other. The master blaster against the bomber. Um, I, I can't believe we haven't sort of discussed it in the past. I think maybe you might have touched on it a few weeks ago about something to do with it, but it sort of got the mind ticking over, and I'm thinking... I said... I, I, I said Barry Michael. And Barry Michael. Peter. He did. You went, you, you, went, you went and grabbed my childhood idol and put him <laughs> in against Bobby Peden, Robbie Peden, who both of them are very close personal friends. But the good part is, irrespective of what I pick, and I'm not going to sit on the fence because I'm, I'm not Splinter's Maniatis, <laughs> uh, regardless, regardless of who I pick, Neither guy's going to be offended by it. They they couldn't really care, so that's yeah, fine. Yeah, I don't think so. But uh, look, I think um, look, obviously not going to be relevant to a lot of our international viewers that watch us each week, and there's a lot of them. Uh, but for the Aussie fight fans, as I said, I think it's really going to um, get uh, the discussion going. And uh, and you know, I know you're, I knew you're really close to uh, Lester, of course. I wasn't quite sure your relationship with Bomber, but either way, the blast, master blaster against the Bomber, I think it'd be a great fight, and one that would. Uh, and they only missed each other by what? I think uh, Leicester won in 85 and Bomber in, in 2005. So sort of, you know, 20 years in, in, the, in the make, or, you know, um, difference between them. But Leicester was still fighting while Bomber was um, a pro. So you never know, it could have happened, but I'm glad it never did. But, yeah, it's an interesting one. It'll be interesting to see where uh, Tazzy stands on this one as well. And hopefully we'll find out next week. Tazzy is going to find the way to miss the program. I, yeah. I, I'll bet money on it. I'll bet money on it. <laughs> Well, we might have to get um, Splinter's Matty Artis on here, I think. He uh, to give us another uh, another um, <laughs> another uh, opinion. But, oh, look, I think it would have been a, a great fight. Uh, I'm not quite sure who I will go with yet. I'm going to have to sit down and have a really good think about it. But either way, I think it would be great. I just think it's a little bit more attractive than the Barry Michael fight. I mean, we all love Barry and respect him a, a lot. And more so the style, that explosive um, you know, speed and power that Leicester had against Bomber, who was more sort of well-rounded, I think. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a, going to be a good one. Yeah, I, I love it. And and like I said, I mean, both both guys are, are good personal friends. So obviously, I've got a very tight, I've got <laughs> a close tightness. I, I wrote Leicester's life story, the film version, uh, which is still being floated out there. So obviously, I'm very tight with the family. But Bomber Peter is someone that. I consider a good friend for really the last 18, 19 years. So, yeah, you're definitely testing me, but that's fine. <laughs> you know, as, 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 as they say, pressure builds diamonds. So I consider myself a diamond, so I've got good. to take on these situations. All right, Matt, nah, we'll look forward to it next week. Hopefully Tassie's there, but if he's not, we might get someone to fill his box. I would really like another opinion on this as well so uh yeah look forward to that mate uh as i said before uh chuck on over garcia this week and next week the master blaster lester ellis against uh robbie bomber peden so thanks again everyone for watching it's much appreciated any requests send them through and uh we'll see you next week